Welcome to the Cannabis Enlightened Podcast with Dr. Leroy, brought to you by March and Ash at marchandash.com. I'm Chris Cantori, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to your host, Dr. Leroy. Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to Cannabis Enlightened. I am your host, Dr. Leroy, and I am very, very happy today to have a very knowledgeable um, and, and friendly-faced individual with me today who knows a lot about cannabis. Uh, he's a scientist, but as I met him um, at a conference, I was able to ascertain right away that he is a very down to earth person who puts cannabis and how cannabis is delivered in a very, very everyday manner. And I, I asked Jeff to come on the podcast and be with us and, and bring us some enlightenment about cannabis. So without any further ado, I'm going to let this gentleman um, introduce himself. And Jeff, would you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're doing right now? Sure. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm, I'm certainly happy to do so. Uh, my name is Dr. Jeff Raber. I've got a PhD in organic chemistry and a bachelor's in biochemistry. I went to University of Southern California for the PhD, where I worked on new synthetic methodologies for mole molecular scaffolds that would be useful in the pharmaceutical industry. So drug discovery, drug design, went on to find chemical manufacturing, and all of my training told me make molecules that are useful for medical and physiological purposes and do so um, if they get commoditized or are useful for generic pharmaceuticals where cost competitiveness in manufacturing is very important. And came to come to learn more about cannabis and thought well, this checks a lot of boxes where it could be cost effective, it can be green and sustainable, and it offers a panacea of opportunity for many folks that may be ailing in different ways. Um, and I think we kind of owe it to society to take a really good scientific look at what this plant has to offer and how we can best harness all those tools and offer opportunities to deliver the right cannabis compositions to the folks in need of them. So Jeff, thank you very much for that, Jeff, that, uh, you know, my audience knows now that you are smart. <laughs> You're smart and, and, and you have a passion for, for cannabis. But let me ask you before I get into that, the main question I was going to ask is what brought you to such a passion for cannabis? I don't know. That's a great question. I think it may be that there's such an opportunity um, to really understand how something that is natural based um, could really impact a lot of folks in many, many ways. When you come to learn that there's medical utility to cannabis and you dive into the library and the scientific literature, you just start seeing more and more and more and more opportunities. And if you see a list of potential ailments that could be recommended, um, you know, under the medical guidelines of a state says cannabis may be useful for this. And you're like, how is that possible that it could be useful for, you know, a hundred different things that seems really, really diverse. Uh, and what is going on there that would provide that type of opportunity? And could that be something that I could throw my effort in for a lifetime and still never have my intellectual curiosity solved uh, and try and figure out what are the ways that we can best harness this? And I just felt it was kind of that like, my, all my training, all my education, uh, and my passion to help people really kind of coalesced under one umbrella that we call cannabis and, and an opportunity in the right timing for my life. Like, how do you really have a chance to shape legislation, regulations, and really introduction of something so valuable into society. It, it was a once in a lifetime opportunity. I didn't want to look back and say, I wished I'd have done it. So I just dove right in and said, let's do it to the best of our abilities and keep pushing to learn as much as we can all the time. Wow. So it, it sounds like at one time in your life, you were on the other side in the pharmaceutical business. You uh, were working with other types of medicines that uh, were man-made and maybe didn't have such good outcomes for folks? Correct. Yep. I mean, we were designing molecules to be studied under, you know, high throughput screening, trying to look for the next pharmaceutical molecular entity and seeing what may be useful to pharmaceutical companies by exploiting environmentally benign synthetic methodologies to make them. Um, so, so you, you know, you think what lock and key, how do I come up with the right molecules and are these things going to be effective for solving a medical ailment, but would they cause, you know, side effects or other potential problems like that? Um, and I, I think, you know, the big piece of cannabis that's kind of come to light for me is it's not one molecule. 
So, and that's a huge difference to the body, right? So you often get a prescription and then they give you something for a side effect or they say, maybe you should try and take this and this too. Um, you know, it's not a single, it's not the magic bullet answer, I think that we hope. Now there are some cases for that and that's fantastic if you can find that. But I think the broad utility and applicability of that is that it's not just one, one molecule is not gonna be perfect for everyone. And when you look at cannabis, you see something like Marinol, right? T THC and high purity formed in sesame seed oil as a pill. It may be useful to a few for anti-emetic purposes or for pain caused from chemotherapy, but it's not useful to many. So how do we broaden that utility? And that's when you start to bring other cannabinoids, other terpenes, and many more compositions. Um, but the concern with if I have many compositions is how do I know that they're going to be safe for those populations? You know, what we get through the FDA is it's very discreet. It's mostly one molecule. And I know it's the same thing every single time so that I'm not so worried about um, toxicity or other safety concerns. But my efficacy, it's better than a placebo and it's, it's good, but is it good enough for as many people? Well, it's good enough to say some are going to get benefit and that's better than zero. But I think like we do miss a lot of folks and you see that especially here, Marinol wasn't useful for everyone or we would never have this conversation. Medical cannabis would have never been needed. But many folks say Marinol didn't work or wasn't the right form. It's not the right molecule for me or the right formulation for me. How do I get the cannabis benefits? Because when I go and consume you know, cannabis product A, B or C, I feel better than if I was trying to take Marinol for it. So um, let me let me dive into that just a little bit. If if a person were taking Marinol, what would they be taking that for? Um, it's prescribed for um, anti-emetic purposes, so nausea or feeling you know like nauseous from chemotherapy, and sometimes for pain as well. Okay, now we're now we're getting into it. So that um, a cannabis uh, or something derived from cannabis can prevent that nausea and also be safe and good for you. Or at least yep. not bad for you. Right. It did get through the safety trials, right? It got all the way through to being an approved formulation. They understood, you know, the pharmacokinetic profiles of that. It's controlled, consistent dose. It's pretty small amounts for most folks, five uh, milligrams or so. Um, but yeah, it, it got all the way through and it was just single molecule THC. Okay. So can I back up a little bit? Uh, you are, or you started working with or for um, green scientific labs? No, I work for the workshop. Our company's the workshop. We founded that in 2010, and that's the only one that I work for. But okay. we work with many, many different folks, okay. and we certainly work in a variety of fashions where we're, you know, back end scientists for them. It's always been our goal to say, here's our suite of scientific and chemical tools. How do we help groups go out there, create a branded product, go build a facility, um, go handle and manage cannabis the best way that they can and make uh, consistent products and consistent compositions for whichever markets they may choose to target. And, and how long has, has your shop, um, your lab been in existence? Um, I think it's 12 years now. We started in 2010 was when we opened our doors. Uh, we started as an analytical testing laboratory. So we did all the analytical back end. And that was, you know, when, when you could start with whatever you wanted to, we had just an HPLC to do cannabinoid analysis and then added a gas chromatograph to do terpene analysis and some pesticides. Um, and we thought this information would be useful to helping regulators understand what they should be testing for. So we got rapid microbiological screening. You know, we were trying to do the best we could when no one told you what you needed to do. Cause, and that's pretty helpful. Cause then you can go tell those that are going to tell you what to do say, I think this would be useful. Here's what other plants do. Here's what's unique about this plant production stream. You know, the chain of commerce and supply chain, what might we need to watch for what things in terms of which pesticides or even plant growth regulators were being applied that should be eliminated. And how do we make this a good product for consumption? And the extra layer is this is a consumable product that is inhaled. Right, so it's not just orally consumed. It's not just a topical. It's got inhalation processes that are in use by patients, and a lot of folks that find that useful. That raises your purity and safety bar, in my opinion. So let's let's maybe go through the process. Uh, we know that cannabis it comes out of the ground. Okay, it's grown. Yep. And once uh, it has grown, it's matured, and it's been cut, and it's um, sent to you. What is your process? 
So we'll, you know, you can do a variety of things. You can test it. Um, that's certainly the very first point. What did, what was produced? What's here? And test it for things that shouldn't be there. So did you cultivate it with um, pesticides or other chemical agents that shouldn't be applied during the cultivation process? So you can check purity and content for active ingredients and, and all the other ingredients that you may choose to look for. And, and once you test it, okay, you've tested the product. Where does it what does it go from there? Right. It depends on what someone would like to do with it. So, you know, is this a an end product, a consumable flour that might be chosen to be sold as flour for vaporization, combustion uses, or people can directly eat that too, of course. Um, or is this going down an extraction path and would then be manufactured into some other um, infused product after that? So from you, it goes to manufacturing? We, we, today we assist a lot of the manufacturers. So we had performed the manufacturing function. So we said, here's extraction methodologies, here's solventless extraction methodologies, here's how to do something in an economically efficient fashion so that you can produce uh, a commodity chemical, right? You don't want to make it more expensive than an out of the reach for many people to get to. And here's how you can do it without leaving any residues behind from that manufacturing process. So we then provide those suite of tools to folks today that are licensed under state license programs. So we'll say, get your biomass, you know, or cultivate it yourself, know what's in there, understand what's present, and then efficiently remove the parts that you want and put it together in a formulation that is consistent, whether that be for inhalation, vape carts, pre-rolls, um, topicals, tinctures, edibles, and other types of infused products, or direct concentrates even in that manner. So for the, the listening audience, um, some people may have purchased um, cannabis, uh, unfortunately, um, not from a, a legal cannabis store. What is the, the danger of that? No one's checking the quality control or what may have been applied. So I have a, an informed perspective on that in 2010 when we opened and, and all the way up to like at least 2016 to 2018 in California, you would see that there was no one saying what you could or couldn't do when you were cultivating or how you could put a product on the shelf. And what we saw along with other labs in the state of California was that there were a lot of pesticides applied to the products uh, during cultivation such that I wouldn't have a pest problem. I wouldn't have, you know, um, spider mites or some sort of other agricultural pests. I tried to preemptively protect against that because this high value crop I wanted to sell would definitely be sold if there wasn't any of those problems. But with no one watching what was applied, we saw large amounts of, you know, pesticides, rodenticides, herbicides, fungicides, but even plant growth regulators that were used to try and improve the yield of those plants. Um, so the commercial interest of how do I produce more mass and more uh, molecules of interest in a smaller confined space kind of overwhelmed safety concerns because plant growth regulators are only meant for ornamental plants and not for anything that we consume. So you definitely are putting yourself in potentially harm's way, depending upon what may be applied in that uh, production or manufacturing process. And okay. I think you don't know that and you don't know your dose, right? So you really don't know what you have. Um, and therefore, it's really hard to use it properly. And it also may be putting you inadvertently in harm's way. Okay, so let me dig a little deeper. Um, someone finds that they can get um, some gray market or black market cannabis. Um, they probably don't call it cannabis. I, I'm not one that uses the M word. Uh, right. Yeah, <laughs> I follow. <laughs> However, let's say they're looking at purchasing some cannabis, um, one for um, maybe $10 and something else that's going to be $50. And they decide to get the $10 that is not from a legal store. What kind of thing or things might be happening or, or could happen to them? It's a really difficult position. I can sympathize with those that that cost difference is tremendous, right? And you know, what am I getting for that cost difference? I'm getting a surety, a purity. I'm getting labels on my products. I know the potency. I know things are supposedly made in a, you know, quote unquote, safe manner. Um, but what I might be getting that I don't know about could be adulterants, could be other things added to that product to make it feel like it was more potent, but it wasn't. Or it could be things that were um, added during the agricultural process of production. So pesticides, rodenticides, herbicides, to make sure none of that showed up on the plant visibly, 
but that it actually did have those molecules on that. And while it, it may be an acute problem for very few, right? You try it once, you're like, I feel sick, this is terrible. It could be a considerable chronic problem. If you're getting something from a supply chain, you know, month over month, and it has some of those chemical agents on there, it really might end up to being something toxic for your, you know, your kidneys, your liver, or other parts of you. Your body has to process those too, and they're not meant to be in there. So you're really... You know, you might have the medicine, but there's stuff going with the medicine that may overwhelm the medical potential of that. And you're putting yourself inadvertently in harm's way. And you might not see that problem for years to come, which is the, I think, the big consideration. Could, could there be a situation where a person feels like um, they're, they're consuming this product and let's say the consumption of it is uh, the THC does uh, produce the high that they're looking for, but they do feel sick. And they feel like, well, maybe that sickness goes along with uh, getting high. Um, what danger do we have there? I mean, I'd, I'd say that's a possibility. I wouldn't say what percent of possibility that is, but the danger is what's causing me to feel that quote unquote sick. I'm trying to utilize this to feel better, right? To go from disease to ease. And if it's not giving me the full ease or something makes me feel sick, then something is wrong. Do I have, I mean, too much THC can do that for people with nothing else there. So that might be the molecules of cannabis causing that, or it could be things that are going along with the, you know, cannabis composition of interest that are causing that. Either way, if you don't feel ease and feel better from that, that's not the right one for you, right? So you need to try and, you know, switch suppliers or switch products to say that was not the right set of cannabis compositions for me under this type of use. I should try something different and make sure I'm feeling better. If I feel, you know, better from one, but bad for another. Like, I don't think that nets out to be where you're trying to get to. So it's your body telling you this still isn't the right answer. And that can be a huge problem for someone in, you know, some states are like, this is all I can get. It's not good. It's not great. It's better than I was, but it still is, you know, not where I'd like to be. And that's, you know, I think that's the frustrating rate of change problem with changing laws and regulations and getting products in everyone's hands. That process takes a whole lot longer than I ever anticipated it may. I, I think what we're getting to is the fact that um, folks need to be taking something that is safe and good for them and not going to harm them. And one of the ways to do that is to purchase it from a store where it has been tested from a lab like yours, um, Correct. regulated, certified, licensed, and so forth. Um, it's almost like the, the buyer beware kind of thing that you, you, you got to know what you're buying and what you're going to put into your body, uh, regardless of how you're going to consume it. Yep. And I think you may have better assurances of consistency through the regulated supply chain, too. I think, you know, a lot of the manufacturers and cultivators are working on doing that in a better fashion. But you don't have, you know, the fly by night illicit uh, cultivator that just disappeared. And that was the right product that was working for you for two months. And then all of a sudden, it's not available anymore. That does unfortunately still happen in the licensed and regulated markets, too. Um, but, you know, I think if you're a patient consumer that's trying to say this is my physiological tool to helping me feel better and it's really working, you want to be sure you can keep getting it. Um, and you probably have a better possibility of that in a licensed regulated market. Um, but I surely wouldn't guarantee that one today yet either. So uh, you, you, you talked about um, uh, some of the ailments that um, can be relieved from cannabis. Uh, and you talked about, I think, um, anxiety um, uh, th that uh, it could relieve um, some, some things from um, maybe radiation from uh, can uh, cancer. What, what else might it relieve? There are a lot of things, right? Inflammation is the root of many problems. It can certainly be useful for that, depending upon what is causing that inflammation. Um, anxiety, pain, um, appetite, uh, mood, all those types of things. Sleep cycles can be regulated through the use of cannabinoid therapy. Uh, and I think, you know, think of cannabis as a balance you know, a way to balance yourself with your environment. So if I'm not feeling fully well, something is pushing me towards disease, how do I introduce something or, or take something away that would, you know, lend me towards feeling better back into a position of ease? How do I balance myself? The endocannabinoid system that we're trying to, you know, 
tweak, fine tune and manipulate with these tools is one that generates homeostasis or balance for the body. So how do I make my body feel at ease in full balance with its environment and itself? Maybe it needs a little bit more of something, you know, tickling a couple receptors of the endocannabinoid system and not just one. Maybe I need to exercise more to get some of that. Maybe I should take some things out of my diet. Maybe it's the combination of three things that will actually get me there. But I think the endocannabinoid system is known to be very fundamental towards many critical homeostasis processes in the body from inflammation to sleep to mood, appetite, you know, those things impact many, many, many diseases that we see today. And I think that's where it could be very helpful. And I think that's why you see like so many different um, potential medical ailments being, you know, useful or, or on some of the state lists. The California list was rather considerable. Other states may have chosen to say, hey, look, this is only good for medical, you know, cancer patients as the last line of defense. It seems like there's a little bit of, you know, legal and regulatory aspects, perhaps driving some of those rather than just pure science decisions. A lot of folks just know a couple of terms. They know THC, and they know CBD, um, but they probably have never heard about the endocannabinoid. So what, what, what does that mean or refer to? It's the network of receptors and molecules that the body makes to interact with those receptors. So how do I send signals across the body um, with this receptor and molecule network. So I'm, you know, I've got a cannabinoid one and a cannabinoid two receptor. There are also many other GPR 55 TRPV ones. There are many other physiological receptors on cell surfaces and in, you know, in the body that say, I'm ready to take a molecule and then send a signal down or upstream, you know, because this molecule interacted with me. Some of the major players in the endocannabinoid system are anandamide or 2-AG, and, and they are formed on demand and then degraded so that they don't stick around. And they're supposed to be produced to control some of that homeostasis or that system's balance. Some of us don't make enough of them for what we really need. Some might overproduce some of them. And it really is, how do I introduce, you know, this cannabinoid or this cannabis composition to help my body balance itself? You know, maybe it's out of balance because these there's too many receptors and I can't interact with them enough. Maybe there are not enough of those, but if I introduce something, their you know expression would go up. I don't think we fully understand all the interplay that goes on. Um, a good example is you can see a scientific review of cannabidiol CBD. And you can see it interacts with 65 different receptors in the body and probably more now that, you know, they keep studying it. So it's not hitting one target. It's not like one key into a lock. It's really doing all those things potentially. Maybe it does more for some over others, but I don't think we really can look at one static study and say, oh, that's all it does. Like, I think that that's really a, a very narrow minded perspective and absolutely isn't the case because when you broaden that perspective, you see it does more. So is it doing all of those at once? Does it do more of some of those than some others? It has the potential to do all of that. But am I encouraging some of that with the other players that go along with my cannabis composition? I think what we do understand is one molecule like CBD alone or THC alone has a very narrow therapeutic utility. There are some small sets of people that would benefit, but not a lot. And when I introduce more of the minor cannabinoids or other cannabinoids and terpenes and things that have the ability to interact with more of these receptors across the endocannabinoid network, I have a better chance of balancing myself in different ways. So, so Jeff, okay, then uh, let me kind of play a devil's advocate. A person, what if a person says, well, why should I worry about that when I can take a, and I hope this is okay to say, I can take a Tylenol or an Advil or an aspirin or something. And, uh, you know, I wait a little bit, maybe 10 or 15 minutes and I feel just fine. Why isn't that solving my indoor? If that solves your problem, system? that's fine, right? I don't think anyone here, like I'm certainly not saying like you must only use cannabis. No, I think it should be available as a tool if you're not finding anything else to be successful. And you may come to find that these molecules are more physiologically friendly, right? And we're using them at lower amounts. So if I say you'd only need five milligrams of CBD as opposed to 500 milligrams of acetyl salicylic acid, you know, aspirin, well, I'd prefer the five because my body doesn't have to work on the 495 other ones, right? So there can be an inherent safety protocol for that. 
And if it's interacting differently, I might find better relief and I might be able to set my system up where I need to use that once every three days instead of every day. Um, I think, you know, put the med in medicine, the minimum effective dose. I want the lowest amount of molecules possible to cause the greatest physiological positive effects. And I think, you know, what we do know about cannabis is that it offers that. And I can even use less if I'm using more of the molecules because I can kind of get this one plus one equals more than two or this synergistic effect to say these host of molecules are going to be better than one single one by itself. And, and uh, NSAIDs like those, other people have problems, right? They'll have stomach irritations. They'll have other problems that show up, especially if, if they're using it for chronic long-term use. Um, so while it may be good to have an Advil every now and then, someone that's taking, you know, three or five of those every single day, they're probably going to see other problems because they're taking too much of that as well. Uh, I was just going to, you, you just ended with something that I was going to say. No, 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 it's great. What we're talking about, it's you, you can use less medicine and it's better for you. Yeah. So, and I, I mean, it might not be better for everyone, right? And no right. medicine or no molecule you put in you is without risk, right? There's always some sort of risk, but I'm lowering some risk potential if I take less. So that's, you know, a good starting point. Um, and I can, you know, lower that even further if I have to take it for less time. So trying to find the most effective benign physiological tool for me is the goal. And I think our position is, hey, cannabis should be one of those. Maybe it's the first choice for most folks. It might not always be, and it might not be a choice that works for some folks, but it should be available. I think the idea that it's not available and it's a natural resource that we could harness that's where I think, you know, a lot of us, and that's what really motivated me to say, we've got to do something about that on a societal sense. It should be available. It should be regulated in the right fashion so we can use it to the greatest of its ability. And we should study it to really understand what we should or shouldn't do with it. We shouldn't just put it on the shelf and say, it's really terrible. No one should have it. I think we can all agree that probably didn't work. That was a pretty poor approach in terms of both the balance sheet and, you know, all sorts of other problems. But why would I not have the ability to utilize this if it can be so effective? And if it can be, why don't I study it really well so I know and those behind me know better so we can choose the right thing to begin with the first time around? Okay. And, and you, you, you also um, are you know, leading into an, another area I wanted to get into. That is um, cannabis right now is a schedule one drug. So it's federally illegal. Does that hamper the amount of research that is done? Yes, most definitely. Now I'll say not all cannabis, right? They've allowed hemp, which is certain varietal or you know cultivars of cannabis that have percentages of THC below an arbitrary number. <laughs> We've said that's okay. Um, but you know, I think they're starting to say, okay, that seems to make some sense. We agree there's some utility to this across even just an agricultural crop for food, textiles, and fuel. Maybe we can use it for other things too. Um, what else might we be able to do if we are allowed to facilitate the research and studies into that? It can be useful in many, many ways. History tells us they were forced to plant it before, right? It's very useful in a lot of ways. Why did we get away from that? Well, maybe we were right to say, hey, there could be potential harms and, and concerns. Let's study those, but it doesn't mean no one should ever have it. So there, you know, it teaches balance. And what we can all agree on is we're not in that state of balance yet with how we should have it in society or where it should fit. And we do need to kind of drive really, you know, pointedly and challenge ourselves to say, what is the best way for the broadest number of folks? If I don't like it, I don't have to take it. If someone else chooses to consume it, well, then they should be informed about their consumption of it and, and have a right to a clean product to do so. So they get that and not, you know, pesticides going along with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so does the fact that it's it's federal illegal does that hamper what you're doing in terms of research no not for us ourselves um and it, but it does hamper pretty much everyone right it makes life way more complex way more challenging and a lot of people with great research tools that you'd like to put cannabis in their hands are still left sitting on the sidelines because they can't get proper licenses and access to things or they get a license and they're told, look at, you know, one cultivar or two things that we're going to provide you with, not everything that you see in a dispensary shelf. Um, and that's not really a real world picture either. So, you know, I think it, it hampers everyone in every possible way. So um, 
from that comment, what are we looking at as, as we look into the future? Um, what things might cannabis solve or help us with? I think there's a, a large opportunity of many different things it could help us with, right? Is it looked at more like a daily vitamin or is it very, you know, specific for medical pieces? I think that is kind of the cannabis challenge or the cannabis problem. It goes across that spectrum because there could be some forms that you're like, this is great. You should just consume the, the trim or the leaves every day. Like it's on your salad. That would be wonderful, right? Like what did the deer do 10,000 years ago when it came across cannabis. It did not roll it up and smoke it, <laughs> right? It chewed on it and it ate right. it. Why? Because it had benefits for its endocannabinoid system. You know, maybe we should think of that the same way. So maybe we get other products, other types. Certainly you can already see there's, you know, a drive towards non-psychoactive products. Like we're not having only those types of products. Um, and I think you'll see more of that, more, you know, more and more types of cannabis and more product forms that really enable us to utilize those and get the right molecules in the bloodstream, not necessarily with inhalation. There should be many other opportunities for that. Uh, and I think, you know, driving, you know, commercial research and other purposes to say, here's a product that consumers will benefit from and, and make rewarding on the marketplace. It doesn't always have to be inhalable, but there are a lot of reasons why we have these as inhalable products, because that introduces a set of molecules to the body. It, and that's what the body really is benefiting from. You get different molecules in the bloodstream if you orally consume it. So it's, um, you know, the liver does things to it and that's a different molecule. So if you eat it raw, you get something different than if you heat it and consume it. And if you consume it via inhalation or oral, you're getting different molecules in all those fashions. And I think we'll see more, we'll see a better idea of what we're actually getting and why we'll understand which ones might be right for which consumers. That's still a big problem. That's gonna take quite some time to kind of guide in a better fashion. But I hope we all understand a lot better like where to start or to, to offer to someone, here are three different product types that you can choose. Come back and tell us which one or two you felt best with. Then we'll give you another three that will narrow in and you can find the right stuff for you in short order, instead of saying, well, I got a thousand things on the shelf, pick one and you know, come back a thousand times and maybe you'll find the right one, hopefully before you get to all thousand. Do you think, do you think doctor, that folks are thinking about the balance, the body's balance or the mind's balance when they consume cannabis rather than I'm going to consume this or I'm going to use this because it's going to relieve something that's wrong with me. Or are those the same thing? Am I talking the same thing? They may be the same thing for some folks, for sure, right? I think some are definitely like, how do I get myself into a position of ease? They might not know that's homeostasis and balance for different physiological systems, but that's kind of what they're, they're gravitating to. And some may say, hey, I feel better an hour after I take it. But that first hour, like I'm a little cloudy in the head. I don't like that type of effect. But since I got eight hours of relief, that one hour was kind of worth it. You know, there might be all of those things at play. I think the most dangerous thing with cannabis is we'll have a tendency to overgeneralize, right? We'll say, hey, this equals that. Well, that's simple and we can all follow it and that would be fantastic, but that's not how this world works, not how the world works in general too many times. And overgeneralization in this context can really lead to inefficiently finding what's the right cannabis composition for that particular consumer. Well, I find a lot of people are trying to equate cannabis with alcohol or cannabis with um, some of the medicines that we've talked about, maybe like a Tylenol or an Advil. But it almost seems like what you're saying is cannabis is in a whole different category. It's probably in its own sphere. And yeah. that the sphere touches all those parts, right? So I can have my, you know, my interface or my border of that sphere talking to the other one. So it runs up against an alcohol type effect. It runs up against the aspirin or medical effects. And it really does touch all of those types of areas. So it's not unusual or, or unexpected that I talk to 10 people and I'm getting 10 different answers of why they all feel different things. But one says it's like alcohol. One says it's like their aspirin. One says it's like, you know, you can get all of those things. And to me, that's the fascinating piece of why we want to harness it. You can get all these things. Well, which one do I take for which of those? So, and how do I know that's right for me? And how do I do so knowing I'm not putting myself inadvertently in more of harm's way by what else is going with it? I think it's important because um, I, I hear this from a lot of people that I speak speak to, and 
as I mentioned to you, the, the time that I met you, I teach a class called the business of cannabis that um, some people are just fixated on that high they get from the THC. And they're not maybe waiting or ready um, or maybe willing to be ready for the, um, the effect that they get after that, that they feel better. It's just that THC-ness yep. that, that they're stuck at. And maybe they like it, maybe they don't. And maybe they find they get that better effect with lower amounts of THC oh, or another okay. cannabinoid, right? But they're not being offered that other cannabinoid. And, you know, should we be aware that, yes, there is habitual um you know, possibilities, there are potential abuse possibilities, you got to be very careful about taking anything on a regular, consistent basis, if it inadvertently wrecks everything else you're supposed to be doing. Um, you know, I think, like I said, nothing's without harm and alcohol, you know, causes alcoholism. And we have a lot of people that can harm themselves that way. Well, cannabis probably has some of that potential for folks. Um, we know other prescribed pharmaceuticals certainly do too. So not providing information or perspective like that, that's kind of holistic and says there are some potential risks. They could be these. Here's the potential benefits. If you're taking this the right way, watch your dose, know what it is, know what you're consuming and make sure you're monitoring how much you're consuming consuming, if your use tripled in the last four months, something's not going right. And you should be able to talk to someone about that. Instead of the company saying, buy more, buy more, how can I give you more of that? Um, you're physiologically out of balance in that direction too. You can have too much of a good thing um, because what you perceived as good today could be bad for you tomorrow. So is, is it safe to say that, that folks need to be patient with cannabis? It's not going to be like a prescription med that your doctor has prescribed for you, uh, you're going to probably have to be your own doctor to understand how much to take, when to take it, and what the outcome is going to be? Yeah, I think patience is definitely warranted. It's going to be necessary. It's going to be a little bit of a frustrating process to try and find the right thing because there are so many variables. Um, but, you know, I, I that was why I was like, don't tell someone this is going to give them that result. And if it doesn't, they think cannabis isn't for them, mm -hmm. right? Say, hey, some cannabis will probably be right for you. You may have to try and error kind of, you know, your way through this. We'll help walk you through the process with the best of our abilities and knowledge today. But we all don't know very much. We all need to learn together. Share with us your experiences and start to, you know, figure out what's right for you, it's going to be a process. And you're going to embark on this journey with something we see as very physiologically mild. It doesn't carry great risk that if you take a little bit too much, you're going to shut off your heart and lungs. So we feel like it's, you know, relatively benign to try. And when you're trying it, it may not be the right one for you. But if you know much about that, then you can say, oh, great, give me something else that's not like that so I can go try that. Mm -hmm. And I think we're about at that point where we're saying, I think I know enough about this to say this one's different than that. So here's an apple or a pear. They're kind of both fruits, but you know, they very different tastes and have very different feel in the mouth. Okay, well, which one did I like or not? Great. I can at least say it's not all fruit today, right? I'm getting the apple and pear, but I don't know what makes the apple and pear very different just yet. So folks ought to be patient um, and, and not expect the same thing, same results or the same type of results that they've experienced with other medication or alcohol. This is a whole different thing. And, and I it, think that's fair. It's its own unique right. animal, right? It, you're going to have to treat it as such. Right. It's particular to the individual. Yeah. So and, and you may be different today than yesterday based on what else has happened, what else you ate. You know, you might be doing some of the same things, but your body's not static from day to day either. So there's always a little bit of, you know, interplay about our environment and everything else that's there. And it can be down to what you're eating or, you know, some of the news you heard might have just made you feel very different today than yesterday. And, and I mean, I think it's important to note that it's natural. I mean, it's, it's Rice is natural too. <laughs> so, right, I can, you know, there's some bad molecules that are natural uh, okay, as well. Okay. You know, I think like the, 
the yeah. whole idea that it's natural, it's good for you. Like yeah. it may be better for you than something that's not, but there are great synthetic things that are good for you as yeah. well. So I try to not label natural as the answer to everything. Okay. Um, the marketing folks do a fantastic job. <laughs> They've, you know, unfortunately put that out there, but yeah. it should be better because it's out there, but it's not always good. I mean, I think study your plants, know it's in them because some are poisonous and toxic, well, that's true. you know, poison ivy is natural too, but that's I don't want true. any parts of that. Well, I, th- <laughs> so. I think the word poison ivy. Yeah. <laughs> we named it well. That was a little better. Yeah. Yeah. I like yeah. your, your reference to your analogy to, you know, deers eating cannabis. I mean, if I could run half as fast as a deer, <laughs> yeah. I would be on every Olympic team. Pretty good shape. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, I mean, that goes to show you that there's something in it that's good um, and that y- you do have to be careful with respect to trying it, using it. Um, but, but as I said at the beginning of our, our talk, you know, you got buyer beware. You have to ask questions and you, yep. you really need to, if you can't talk to people like you, you certainly need to be listening to these kinds of podcasts. <laughs> Hopefully they're helpful and go low and start, you know, go slow and start low, right? So take your time, use it a little bit and try and figure your way in there. Don't, you know, somebody's like, oh, I take 50 milligrams you didn't know that guy was using it for three years before they got there, right? Like five or even two may be a good place for yourself. It's okay to start with a low amount and go slowly up to find the right one. Put the, you know, the med in medicine, the minimum effective dose for yourself. Okay, uh, Jeff, as we start to um, end up our, our podcast here, can you tell folks how they can get in touch with you? Give us some information. Certainly happy to do so. We're available on the web at theworkshop.com, T-H-E-W-E-R-C-S-H-O-P.com. Um, also on Instagram, LinkedIn, and social media handles of those types. So feel free to hit me up there uh, or any one of us, and we're happy to answer all the questions that you guys might send. Thank you very much, Doctor. I really appreciate your time that you gave us. Your words um, are golden, and I look forward to talking with you again. Thank you for the opportunity as well. I really appreciate it. If you'd like to hear more Cannabis Enlightened with Dr. Leroy, be sure to visit us online at CannabisEnlightened.com and subscribe wherever you download your podcasts. Cannabis Enlightened is produced in San Diego, California and presented by March and Ash at MarchandAsh.com. On behalf of Dr. Leroy, I'm Chris Cantori, and thank you for listening.